Yeah, welcome back to Star Spangled Gamblers. We're your OG political betting podcast. Uh, today, I guess I should asterisk specify that we are your OG American political, political betting podcast. We've got a super special guest today. His name is Jason Trost of Smarkets, a UK-based peer-to-peer betting exchange. Jason, did I get that right? Yeah, you you were a little hesitant when you said it. You can say Jason Trost and uh, you know not not second guess yourself. Trost like the most, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're an American who has immigrated to England slash the UK. Um, that doesn't really make any sense. That sort of steps on our whole national story. What are you What are you doing over there across the <laughs> pond? Well, there is this whole taxation. Of- <laughs> Um, no, uh, what I went, what happened was one of my buddies from undergrad, I went to Northwestern, one of my buddies from undergrad was living in London said, there's a company that lets you trade on sports called Betfair. And, uh, mm-hmm. even though they were making tons of money, weren't doing it the right way. So I always wanted to do a business with this guy. So I quit my job and moved over to London. Um, did you get the hives halfway on that wooden sailboat headed across the Atlantic? <laughs> well, going that way, it's, uh, you get the doldrums around the, uh, the equator. So it's a lot harder to sail, sail east. Um, so we were at sea for a good uh, five months instead of oh. going the other way. Oh, uh, did you slaughter the horses for food somewhere around <laughs> Barbados? And we ran out of oranges, so it was quite tough. <laughs> oh, so you are a limey. Um, uh, okay, well, I, as you know, um, we'll, we'll get into markets in a little bit, but I want our audience of Yanks to uh, know whether or not they can trust you. The immigration rules are very specific in the United States, the Trump administration. So I want to get to the bottom of whether or not you're a U.S. national or, or a Brit at this point. So uh, just a few questions and we can proceed. When, I, when you use the word football, what are you referring to? <laughs> Usually uh, soccer. So, so the, the British version. <laughs> Have you retired the word soccer from your vocabulary? <laughs> no, I actually, I, to be honest, soccer is, is usually a better term because everybody knows what you mean. But when you say football, half the room doesn't know what you mean. So soccer is, is a better term. Got actually, to, to, if I can hit a quick pause, one of my pet peeves is English people get really upset with you when you say the word soccer. But almost no English people know that soccer is the original term for the sport and it comes from the uh abbreviation of association football so you can imagine soccer coming out of association football and they use it it to distinct disambiguate it between rugby so soccer is actually the english term for the sport uh that's interesting so using soccer in the uk is kind of like saying america is the second greatest company country in the usa (laughs) yeah something like that yeah okay uh two more questions for you sean connery was he better in The Rock and The Untouchable or Goldfinger and Thunderbolt? Uh, Goldfinger. And which of the following events are you more likely to tailgate for? A marriage involving two people who have a hereditary claim to the throne or a marriage involving cast members of The Bachelor and or Vanderpump Rules? Uh, something, uh, n- neither of those two shows, but definitely reality television. Okay. All right. So you got a little bit of yank left in you. I'm, but I'm I think a 90 that, day fiance uh, aficionado. So some, it's one of those couples I would definitely be at. Let's go. All right. Well, I think your immigration papers are good enough to come back to the USA, but we, we might need to hire a lawyer or something. Anyway, uh, most importantly, <laughs> most important, the most important question, though, for our audience is we primarily trade on Predict It, which is a betting platform that our audience is very familiar with, and I'm sure you are too. But you are the CEO of a betting platform called Smarkets. What the hell is the difference between Smarkets and Predict It? And what type of political odds do you offer? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's just a legal, legal license issue. So the Predict It uses goes under something called the CFTC, and they basically have a no action letter from the CFTC. It's a little bit jargony, but CFTC is the federal regulation, federal body that regulates commodities. And for some reason, political betting is deemed to fall under that remit. And uh, so we haven't gone through that paperwork to do that. We, we it's, a, it's on our backlog of stuff to do, but we, in the UK, political betting call, falls under the auspices of sports betting. And so by virtue of having a sports betting license, we can do political betting in the UK. And in general, everything's more liberal uh, for sports betting in the U- UK anyway. So uh, we do all of our political betting in the UK under our sports betting license. So before I start salivating, are you clearing political bets in the USA? No. No. Are you going to? No. We, uh, we want to. We want to. Yeah. It's a lot of paperwork. So you have to petition the CFTC. You have to find an academic partner. And we probably have to segment our site so that it's, you know, smarketspolitics.com instead of smarketspolitics.com. 
com, and it has to be for you know quote unquote academic purposes. But it's definitely something we we want to do. And and to you before before we move off the boring back end, but is do people in the UK like is it a thing? Do people know that political betting exists in the UK, or do they look at you like a freak the way they do in this country? Oh no 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 yeah it's big. It's like uh like betting is a more overt part of the culture. You know it's common to talk about uh. You know, when there's the royal marriage, uh, there were bets on the color of the queen's hat. You know, stuff like that is kind of fun. More, a lot of those kinds of bets are what I would call novelty bets. And I would, I would, you know, they're more done for PR and for like water cooler talk rather than yeah. serious people wanting to bet. And I think political betting in general falls under a novelty bet genre where most people do it for a bit of fun. There are a few people that take it very, very seriously and they'll use markets and a few other sites. Uh, but in general, it's very common, but it's also considered more of a uh, of a fun enterprise rather than something serious where, you know, you investigate it and trade it seriously. So uh, on the issue of what's serious and what's not, before we kind of proceed to our format here, seriously, why should we use your platform and not Betfair or Predictit or Ladbrokes or like, like, let's go, let's hustle here? <laughs> uh, price. Uh, we, we have the best odds. Show me the money! So that, that's what we try to hang our hat on. I used to be a trader, study computer science, and I kind of, I came at uh, sports betting from the financial angle and, and the average margin in sports betting, at least sports betting online is about a seven to 8% margin product. And we're trying to make it a one to 2% margin product. So a lot of the places that you bet, uh, Betfair included, have either high commissions or high bid offer spreads. And, uh, and it's just very expensive. So the reason to use us is price. Ah, your volume guy. And quality. Volume and quality. That's where we're all volume and quality officially, right? I guess we're neither at Star Spangled Gamblers. Well, okay, so let's let's have fun. So as you know, as our audience is hopefully trained by now, when we have special guests like you, we like to talk about big themes and we like to talk about them through playing some bar games. So we're going to do a little would you rather where we give you some uh, maybe two terrible options or one really great option, two really great options. And we're going to torture you to tell us which trend or which bet you'd rather make is this like marry kill or uh you know? you know it's actually hilarious because when we first conceived of it this was our i'll say the word correctly fuck marry kill segment but pratik talked me out of calling it fuck marry kill fair, fair enough uh never have i ever to, uh never have i ever listened to pratik um <laughs> all right so jason without further ado would you rather bet on Senator Kamala Harris to be the vice president at 39 cents or Donald Trump to win re-election at 39 cents, the same odds, which is more or less where we are right now? Which one would I rather back? Which one would you which rather Which one back? would I rather, would I be long or short? Long. I'd rather be long Trump at 39. Really? That's spicy. For some reason, I don't like Kamala for VP. I, I don't feel it. I don't feel like her and Joe have a good rapport. And, then, and you know, when she attacked him during the debates, I think he can look past that. But I just, I don't feel them being a good pair. Next. Are, are you, I, I'm on team Joe Biden just wants to have a VP that he wants to hang out with and likes. I, mean, I think so. Right. I think so. But I, I also think he knows he's old and he knows the VP he picks is like kind of the future of the party. And so I think he's also viewing it from that lens. And I think he also knows like the democratic party needs a new generation. So like, even though she's older, I, my, I hope he picks Elizabeth Warren because she kind of represents the new progressive energy in the, in the democratic party, but she's not, uh, she's not African American and uh, she's older. So I don't know, but that's, that's who I want him to pick. What would you put of the likelihood of Biden picking an African American woman uh, generally? Twenty percent. Mm. Thirty percent. Pratik, I feel like the two of you need to go like have a nice glass of Chablis and just talk about things. That you... Jason, you literally sound like Pratik. Like Pratik, can you <laughs> well, find any fault in Jason? <laughs> no. So I mean, as as you might know from our previous episodes, we were uh, pretty bearish on. Uh, Klobuchar, uh, which obviously turned no, out bullish. not to be correct. We were very bullish. On bullish, Klobuchar. bullish. Sorry. Um, I mean, basically, our our thesis is that, or was anyway, uh, was that Biden wants to make this a referendum on Trump. He wants to shore up a lot of the constituencies that swung to the Democrats in the 2018 midterms. Um, I actually wrote a blog post. I thought it was uh, unlikely that, that Biden would pick an African-American woman. I get into a variety of reasons why. But um, 
I at least have have re begun to rethink this uh, thesis, but partly because of the George Floyd uh, situation, but also just the extent to which identity politics has taken over the Democratic Party to to a scale that I would not have thought. But do you think maybe we're, you know, the Floyd thing was just kind of a high point of identity politics, or how do you? think Biden will think through this. Well, the, the the Floyd thing, I mean, I'm sure like most people just, it really struck me how much of a sea change came out of that. So like, you know, like these, these movements and instances in time pop up over and over again, but uh, rarely, you know, rarely does it bring about the change of that I think that came out of it. So I, I do think that, that that does change the, uh, the framework of uh, picking a VP, but the I think the thing, if I were Biden, I think he's kind of, I don't think he should get over cocky, but I think the election is his to lose. And I yeah. think he's got a little bit more green grass to like have a vision for what he wants the future of the party to look like. So I don't think he needs to pick like Al Gore in Tennessee to get, you know, the Southern vote, um, you know, that kind of thing. I think he, he has a little bit of a luxury that, uh, you know, the top of the ticket is going to be the focus and he can uh, be a little bit strategic. I, you know, I think he's like, he's been in politics forever. I think he's a guy who, you know, even if you don't like him that much, I think he really, really, really cares. Um, and I think he wants to, he wants to America, to, you know, like a lot of normal people wants America to kind of get back into solid footing. So I would, I, if I were on his team or I were him, I would be looking for somebody, A, he fits with, like he, like he says he does, but also B, like who's the future of the party. Now I know a lot of people really like Stacey Abrams and I've heard her speak and I think she's really good. The problem with her, I just feel like she's so inexperienced. Yeah. I feel like I she's, she's too, kind of game over. She, she's too green for a, uh, for a VP role. Um, but who knows? I, I mean, I mean, I, she's definitely uh, got a bright future. I sort of view the, the, the pitch, like the implied lot of small print way down at the bottom of the page of Biden 2020 as like, he's like one of those popes that the church picks when everyone's like really pissed off. And they're like, look, you're old. You're going to die soon. You're not going to piss anyone off. Like just get everyone to chill out and we'll figure out what to do next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life. No, I see. I, I, I like I'm lost in like, is he talking about Benedict or is he talking about uh, who's the current? I don't know. There are a lot of popes, dude. There's like 500, aren't there? Yeah. Wow. And it's, sometimes there's like three at once. I don't know. Yeah. History, anyway. History's long. Yeah, history. no, I know what you're saying. But I think there's, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of pro Joe sentiment is like, we need somebody to beat. Um, I don't know. People beat up on him a lot and, and I can see why they do. But I, I think he's a good guy. I think he's a good, you know, he works he hard. He can take it. Uh, yeah, he can take it. I mean, he's like, I, I do think he's, you know, he is getting up there in age, but I think he's a, a quality guy who, who knows what he's doing and uh, was a good uh, legislator and a good um, executive under Obama. Well, I was going to just do one more follow up on, on that one. We got a lot of mail um, from a number of people asking about the uh, law enforcement background of a number of these candidates. So Kamala is one, Val Demings is another. Uh, do you have a view on how much of a liability, if at all, uh, that will be? I, you know, in terms of like the election, like, I don't know. Like I said, I think it's Joe Biden's to lose. So I think in normal times it would matter more. But like we are so like blinded by the corruption of the current administration that, you know, like Kamala Harris doing something bad will seem like a traffic ticket when she was 17 years old. So I don't know. I, I don't think it'll matter that That's much. Clever. I like that. Um. All right, changing it up now. Would you rather? I can't put a. I can't put odds on this, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. Would you rather get stuck in an elevator with Ted Cruz or Boris Johnson? That's actually a good question. I, For you. you know, like what, what? What I always really wonder about these guys is like, is their boofish public persona like who they really are? So I would, I would be really curious both because I think both are smart dudes. Yeah, but like I would really, I don't know. That would be a hard choice. I probably what? would pick Ted Cruz because he's a bigger enigma to me than Boris Johnson. To me, I feel like I understand Boris Johnson better than Ted Cruz. Like Boris Johnson is just a guy whose ambition is like he doesn't give a shit what he says and he will say whatever he needs to say to become prime minister and it ended up working for him. Whereas Ted Cruz, I think he will never be president he never has a chance to increase his popularity beyond what it is now. So I really, I'm, I'm curious, like, does he really believe 
the stupid shit that comes out of his mouth or is it strategic of some some sort so i i, I would pick ted cruz i also think the heavy amount of like hair mousse and boris johnson's hair might like that the quality of the oxygen in the elevator could diminish what about um bernie Sanders i don't think it's Richard? mousse i think it's sweat and uh sweat and grime more more things that i don't want in my nostrils uh what about bernie sanders or jeremy corbyn you're stuck in the elevator would you rather bernie sanders really <laughs> yeah. jeremy corbyn i am not a fan of jeremy corbyn i don't know what it is about that guy but i was very upset when uh I was a David Miliband fan. I don't know if you went back that far in labor politics, but I think labor really screwed the pooch when it picked uh, Ed Miliband over David Miliband. So Ed Miliband was like the worst version of the Miliband brothers. And then Jeremy Corbyn was just, he's just so far off the deep end. Um, I wouldn't want Bernie to legislate, like I wouldn't want Bernie to be in charge, but I do really like his energy and his like leftward move. If you can't tell I'm a liberal, uh, but I do like, uh, I do like Bernie's ideas, but I didn't, I wouldn't like him as an executive. Well, we do have a, a market on Boris Johnson that, that could be quite profitable. Um, the market is which of uh, five European leaders will leave office next. Um, Boris Johnson is trading at 8%. And to give you an idea of the rest of the market, uh, Merkel is at 62%, Conti, the prime minister of Italy, at 14 Macron at 8%, and Sanchez at 7%. Uh, do you think the markets are basically correct or, or would you recommend going in anywhere there? Well, it sounds about right, but when's Merkel's ter term limit up? It's like next year, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's like, will anyone quit before Merkel in 2021? Yeah, I mean, the only way Boris would go is if he quit or there's a vote of no confidence. And the chance of a vote of no confidence is probably close to zero. And the chance of him quitting is probably close to zero as well. So I, do, I to be honest, I would like sell 8%. Of those, yeah. uh, of those people. Well, I don't, I don't he's think immune it's to the coronavirus too, right? Yeah. But we don't know that yet, do we? <laughs> we don't know if it's going to come back. Yeah. 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 All right. So Max, Max, no, Boris Johnson at ninety two. Just the, 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 you know. All right. Sell. Let's go. Sell Boris. Wait, but you also said you're you're big Elizabeth Warren fan. That's cool. We're, we're we're fans of everyone. This is basically a sports podcast for politics. You said on Twitter that you voted for Warren. Um, would you rather bet her to be the VP? The, the odds of this are about the same. They're around 10%. Would you rather bet Elizabeth Warren to be VP or that Trump resigns before his term is over? Warren VP. Like, uh, I don't think Trump will resign, no. He's a, he's a, he's a what's, what's the word? Malignant narcissist? I mean, I don't think those, I don't think malignant narcissists are capable of quitting, are they? Um, I don't know. There's always the take my toys and go home version. I, I'm not saying that's the likely version, but. I don't think he can. I don't think so, he can psychologically. Yeah. At, at current market prices, Warren is at 8%. Uh, the odds of Trump resigning is at 12%. Um, I think the 12% is actually wildly off because even if Trump's term prematurely ends, I don't think it's going to be from a resignation. I, I agree with Jason. I, I think his ego wouldn't allow that. I, I think it's much more likely it would happen due to some kind of a medical incident. Um, so. I, I, I'm going to try to max out uh, no here in the resign market. His physician said he had the body of a 23-year-old varsity athlete. Mm -hmm. Is that what the, what the regime says? <laughs> Let's go to long short. Second segment, we don't want to take too much more of your time. We don't want to take too much more of our audience time. Are you long or short that the U.S. government's going to deregulate political gambling and let you guys come in here and give us awesome stuff to bet on? Short. Mm, short in the next couple of years or short in ever short in the next couple of years what about states short states can't do it until the cftc clears it out because it's under their jurisdiction can you give us some good news uh sports betting is coming online yeah but i'm like an idiot you can move to a country that has uh sensible laws I could, what, I got to move to a country where everyone's like too drunk to set good lines, like move to the I, Czech uh, Republic. I'll send you my wooden boat and just hop on and in four months. You'll be uh, on the good side. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go. Uh, long short, Joe Biden is underpriced, unpredicted at 65% odds of winning the presidency. Long as in, I think he's underpriced. I don't know, Pratik. I've been like sweating whether or not to buy into Biden again. I feel like there'll be a dip at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, only we, if he has a huge gaffe, I think. Yeah, but he'll mess something up. 
Yeah, we, but like Trump is a car crash at second. I mean, he just said uh, Maxwell is, you know, I wish her well. Like he, the guy literally cannot say anything right. Yeah. PJ, when, like, somewhere in the campaign cycle, there'll be a moment where we can, I feel like we can anticipate a dip that we can buy into. Like, is there just something naturally that happens? We, we've had a number of uh, mail items on this, and uh, I would say the number of people who think uh, Trump has a shot uh, here is dwindling. I mean, you know, the only possibilities he, he has, I think, are, like you said, a Biden meltdown. But really, the only opportunity for that, I think, is in the presidential debates uh, or maybe a health crisis. But, you know, even the presidential debates, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but with the 24-hour news cycle, I'm not sure they're the big event that they used to be in past uh, election cycles. And I suppose the other possibility would be a significant upturn in the economy uh, right around election time. Um, I mean, I don't know, Jason, do you have a view on what the economy might be like in the next uh, couple of months? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, with my armchair economic skill set, uh, I think the economy is not like the stock market to me is is unbelievably irrational at the moment. Like, I mean, so many people have lost their jobs. So many industries are destroyed. Um, so many people, yeah, like are getting unemployment benefits. So I don't know. I don't think the short term is very good. I definitely think we're entering a recession. If I think we're technically in a recession already. But um, if not, a, a uh, I mean, I think... Um, I think that uh, it's not going to be good. So the chance of the economy recovering in the next 100 days is very, very low, uh, I think. In terms of the debate, I think it was Thomas Friedman um, who had an article that uh, Trump should have some preconditions uh, to the debate. Oh, God, I saw that. Said, yeah, which I thought was a really clever idea. So off the back of that, you know he's not going to agree to it. I don't think that – I don't think Biden should debate Trump. I don't think anything good would come out of it. So I saw that article and I thought it was like, wow, this is like peak Thomas Friedman, like kind of liberal catnip. But uh, I, it, it was yeah, <laughs> that's proof. Um, I, but the thing that was funny about it to me is I was like, I was trying to think about like why he was wrong. And I was like, I don't know, like, is he a critique? Like, yeah, it's a dilemma. I mean, I'm thinking of a couple sort of options here. I. One of the markets that I lost uh, some money on was in uh, 2016, early in the primaries, on the question of who would win the Iowa caucuses on the Republican side. This was in 2016. Uh, I thought Trump would win, and I, I think I would have been correct but for Trump at the last minute backing out of that debate and throwing a tantrum. And I think that probably did it. I think if Trump had been in that debate and had an unremarkable performance, it wouldn't have alienated people. So I do think there's a cost. Um, to not participating and giving uh, your opponent sort of that that leverage. Um, so I think probably a preferable option would be for Biden to do the debates and make it so boring that no one pays attention and allow the election to be a referendum. Uh, but I do think, I mean, given the kind of debate performances we saw out of Biden uh, in the primaries, uh, they, they just weren't very good. And, you know, your your flaws kind of get obscured when you have 10 other good people on the stage, but one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know. It could be a liability. Yeah. Even more reason to not do it. You know, I think it's, like I said, it's Joe's race to lose. And I think it's easier for the, the person who's in the poll position to not do the debate than, than vice, you know, the, the one who's second wants to do the debate, I think. And the one who's in first doesn't want to do the debate, but uh, you know, to, to, to the liberal catnip point, you know, like Trump, really should be releasing his taxes. And it's a good way to highlight that, uh, that kind of issue or joke. He could pick a different issue and saying like, uh, we need a nationwide ban on, on masks, or I'm not going to do the debate. And, uh, I think if you pick the right thing, it doesn't look trite and, uh, it makes Trump look like an idiot. Well, I was going to say though, I mean, here's the counter argument, which is that Biden's expectations going into the debate are so low that if he performs even adequately well, I mean, this could turn from like a Biden advantage to really in uh, blowout territory. Um, we kind of saw that in the Reagan Carter uh, debates where the election was fairly close. And right at the end, Reagan has strong debate performances. Um, we, we've actually had a number of uh, very diverging uh, views coming in from our readers on what the margin will be of the Trump Biden a victory. We, you know, some people think we're kind of at a high point and the election will narrow a bit. 
Um, but some people think, and, and I would include myself in this category, that Trump is, has not bottomed out and that we could really uh, see a landslide here. Do you, do you have a view on the margin and um, what states will ultimately be in play and, and which ones won't? Yeah, I mean, the problem is that my, my glasses are very much tinted with what I want to see. But, you know, I tend to think it's going to be a landslide because it's just he he can't get better. I mean, he's got that mental illness um, and he like he's incapable of getting better. And he just like every day it's just worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and uh, there's some article or something that came out yesterday that says we're reporting, you know, there's like 10 times more cases of COVID than we're reporting right now. Like things are going to get a lot worse. Like the economy uh, is going to be extremely challenged. Uh, there's going to be more hospitals filling up and he is just not the right guy who should be in that office. And like, nobody is going to be looking at him. Even like, I think crazy Trump people and be like, yeah, he's doing a good job. I think the best that you can say is that it wasn't his fault, you know? And if the best you can, as a Trump supporter, the best you can say it's not his fault, you know, he's not in, in a good place. So I, I don't know. I think it's going to be a landslide uh who what was the most modern recent landslide was it reagan carter probably 84 does that sound right yeah um yeah 84 mondale i think uh, i think mondale won what minnesota and that was it yeah i don't think it'll be like that but i i don't think it'll be close which Um, is good i mean it's a good repudiation well okay let me ask you then i'm gonna like quick quick rapid fire here all right different different places where republicans could get their faces absolutely ripped off are you long short them winning back any seats in Orange County that they've had for like all 300 years of well, now California is like 100 years old? I long think short, they'll get one. Or, I think they'll get one or two. Long short getting those seats back in Dallas and Houston. Short. Short. Ooh, you're you're a blue Texas guy, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, long short Republicans in Georgia. Two Senate races there. Uh, long. The Republicans against. I think they'll keep them. Uh, long short North Carolina is a red state. 2020 short Woo. we kind of think this is going to be a landslide too uh long short critique what am i missing um arizona oh don't even go there that's too sad for us former republicans that is a trigger <laughs> well i i guess uh, you don't like astronauts i like astronauts. everybody that's likes astronauts problem. that's the everybody problem everybody likes us that's like you got a fighter pilot and an astronaut the astronaut's way cooler you know yeah way cooler uh, I, Iowa and Ohio are the other two. I think I, Ohio will stay red. And I think I saw, I think Trump will keep Iowa. Trump will keep Iowa. I've made a lot of money trading Jody Ernst's campaign as the, uh, the closest. Um, well, I've, I've sort of emptied my bag of tricks on you. Uh, I've been trying to step on your toes, Jason, this whole time, but I feel like you're sort of a step ahead of me. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. So my, my ego is wounded, but um, in mean, fighting weight. Yeah. It, it, anyway, this is this has been wonderful. Uh, we don't usually get to have CEO level people on this podcast. People don't know that we're the greatest podcast and the greatest blog in the history of the internet. But uh, Jason, you and your followers uh, surely are now aware at this point. Um, Pratik, you got anything to take us home, or we want to just say goodbye to the fam tonight. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about what you have uh, planned going forward for the company and how we can be helpful to you or, or our viewers, Kim? Yeah, uh, I'm super passionate about political betting, but it's a little bit of a, it's more of a passion project than, you know, I don't think that political betting is ever going to supplant uh, sports betting. The problem with political betting is these events happen, you know, in the presidential example, it's every four years and, you know, they don't happen often enough. Whereas, you know, a horse race happens, there's one every 30 minutes. So I think the nature of political betting is is somewhat challenged just because there's not that regular cadence to sports and the finality to sports. Uh, but it's where I'm really passionate about political betting is as a tool for the, the community to use it, it, it like a weather report, like a weather report for the event so that you have a place to go to get real time information about where you think the market's going. So we're definitely going to keep investing in it. Um, from a business perspective, the main thing I'm focusing on is sports betting expansion in the United States. So we just launched in Colorado and we're going to launch very soon in Indiana. And those are our first two states. And we have a product that's called SBK, which is basically a sports book interface that sits on top of our exchange. Um, and that's, uh, that's where my, my focus has been trying to go live in the United States. Um, well, I don't know if you know this, but we love to be people's affiliate partners. So, uh, 
Hi. Hey. <laughs> That's how you can support us. But uh, if, if there's anything we can ever do to support you, we'd like to do it. We have wonderful, engaged listeners. Uh, and, uh, and, and the boys, the boys love the, the boys. Is that an awkward thing to say? Uh, probably PJ, Jason, this has been awesome. I'm keen dog. This is star spangled gamblers. Check out our blog, www.starspangledgamblers.com. If you love this content, if you think, think it's exciting, go over to the tab that says support. That's how you get our message out into the world. Well, you know, the, the more you give, the more we make sound like a preacher on Sunday when I say that, but, uh, Jason Trost. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Smarkets, check it out. PJ, it's been awesome. Until next time.